everybody, thanks for joining us today. We have about 200 people that are signing up for this and we're still letting a few more people come through. So we'll just get started here in a few minutes. Again, thanks for joining us and we'll get started shortly. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for the first Elevate SD webinar. I'm Mark Olson, I'm a manager of public relations here at MTS. So we're really excited about this webinar today that we're doing. We're rolling out a plan to improve the transit system in San Diego, talking about the future of transit in San Diego. And we're gonna talk about it, we're gonna run you through the entire plan as it stands right now. We think it's a great plan that can help produce traffic relief, improve accessibility to jobs and education, reduce air pollution and much more. Um, so the, the plan that you're going to see today is the latest development as MTS works towards a potential ballot measure for the November 2020 election to ask voters to invest more money in transit. Um, so we do have some guests here today. Very lucky to have um, a few very important guests to transit in San Diego. First, we have um, MTS CEO Paul Jablonski, and we have uh, Supervisor Nathan Fletcher, who's the MTS board chair. And then we have Maya Rosas with Circulate San Diego. So thanks, thank you all for joining you, us. Um, you know, I think we'll just kick it off with some questions, you know, to set the table. And I think the first question will be for Chair Fletcher. And, you know, the, the region's facing a lot of challenges today. And you know, we think that transit can really be a solid solution to address a lot of those challenges. So can you give us some of those challenges and how transit can be a solution and why transit? Why transit now? Well, and I, I, think, I think when you think about transit, um, it's really important, I think, to understand. You know, a lot of folks think that it benefits folks who use the trolleys and the buses and the, and the various ways, and that's certainly true. But an investment in transit benefits everyone. Uh, it benefits all of us. Uh, we released an economic impact report. We know there's a tremendous economic return for the entire region uh, based on investment in transit. Uh, we know that there's incredible benefits to our environment, lowering greenhouse gas emissions and helping tackle climate change and cleaning up the quality of the air. Um, but we also know that when it comes to issues of congestion, and and so many families out there spend so much of their time stuck in traffic um you know when, when we talk about things that we make a modest investment as san diegans and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of new folks that are going to utilize those, those, that, that new system and those new lines that's hundreds of thousands of folks who would otherwise be stuck in traffic and so whether you're talking about the economic benefit with jobs and economic activity the environmental benefit the traffic relief and congestion um, or just connecting us all and, and having having the city and the region that, that we want to have, um, I think I think it's incredible. And so to go out and to to folks um, and say, look, we you know we want you to consider making a modest investment. 
um, in something that we know has such tremendous benefit um, is why I think we've seen so much support and encouragement behind what we're doing. Yeah, that's, that's a good point you bring up about con uh, you know congestion and traffic congestion. We heard that out in the community a lot. People yeah. are just very frustrated with what's happening right now and the challenges that are presented to them every day when they're on the highways trying to commute, yeah. you know, but. And, and, and I think I think sometimes San Diegans may not be aware that, you know, we carry 300,000 San Diegans a day, every single day. Yeah. And if we have the potential to take that to 400, 500,000 folks, those are folks who are utilizing our buses and trolleys. And so, you know, we hear from a lot of folks who say, look, I want more trolley service. I want more bus lanes. I want dedicated bus only lanes. Uh, I want this option or that option. Um, and 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 an and increase is good for folks to provide those, but for the folks out there who say, you know what, I'm I, I I'm in the delivery business, or I got to pick and drop off kids, and this is never going to work for me, it's still good for you, um, because it will simply take some of those folks who are stuck in traffic, give them an option, and it really is about giving transportation options to folks, right? Um, and uh, and doing something good for our region. Yeah, and yeah, no, that's a good point. And. You know, you also mentioned connectivity, and I know that's right in the wheelhouse of Circulate San Diego, you know, and improving transportation options. And, you know, Maya, what do you see as the biggest needs for transportation? And why do you think transportation is such a critical piece to the policy conversation in San Diego right now? Well, I think Supervisor Fletcher hit the nail on the head with transportation options. It's about providing opportunities for everyone to make the choice whether they want to drive, take transit, or even bike around. Um, but transit isn't actually an option if it takes double the amount of time as it would driving. And so um, it is critical that we find a way to make transit time competitive so that more people can spend their time with family um, and choose how they get around instead of being stuck in traffic. Yeah, and I think time competitiveness is really something that you're going to see in the Elevate plan that Paul's going to go through is really cutting down on those commute times for people taking transit and getting it more competitive with the automobile. So that's going to be a big a big part of what we're talking about. Um, so I think now we're going to dive into the presentation a little bit with Paul, and we're also going to have some Q&A and some more dialogue as we move along. And um, But before we get started with the plan presentation, we wanted to give everybody a brief overview of how you can participate throughout. So, and that's been very important to this process. You know, the community is being informed, you know, and providing that feedback loop to us is very important to gauge what you're thinking and answer your questions and help keep this plan informed by the community. So on screen, what you're gonna see right now is you can submit questions on both a desktop computer and the GoToWebinar app. So submit those questions throughout the presentation. We'll filter through them and then we'll get those on for the Q&A at the end. Another way we're gonna keep you engaged is through interactive polls. So we're going to launch a sample poll right now. So on the screen, we want you to select your answer that best reflects how familiar you are with the Elevate SD prior to this webinar. And while y'all are answering that poll, we wanna let you know that we're gonna be sending out a more thorough survey to participants after the webinar series ends that way you can provide more detailed feedback and everyone who completes that survey will be entered to win one of several prizes. So we're giving you that incentive. We want you to win a prize, but we also want some feedback. So, so we're coming up with the results now and, um, and then we're gonna turn it over to Paul. So I think, what do we have for us? Okay, so 70% is very familiar or somewhat familiar with Elevate SD, so that's good. Our message is getting out there. You have been actively engaged. We want to get that other 30% familiar with it too, so thanks for joining us. I think um, you know when we had everybody sign up for this webinar, it turned out about 50% use transit regularly, but the other 50% of people you know didn't use it all that regularly. So that's a really good balance that we have with people that are interested in using the transit system and a built-out transit system. So, so now I'm going to turn it over to Paul for today's presentation. Thank you, Mark, and I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us uh, here this afternoon. As we get started, we wanted to introduce and remind people about the framework and the high-level goals that we started this initiative with. And that was to connect where people work, where they have to go to school, and where they live. Create a plan that we can implement very quickly. We see needs right now, and we don't want to wait 30, 40, 50 years for that to happen. We want to provide alternatives to cars. We want to be able to move across the county at the same speed that cars do. And, and lastly, we wanted to have a very positive impact on the environment. So the, as, as many people know, climate action plans, greenhouse gas reductions are being talked about all the time. 
and we wanted to have that impact. So Paul, with the map that people are seeing on the screen right now, can you describe that a little bit about the connections that are being made with the different lines? Sure, and if you look at that map on the right, that's basically what we're trying to do. I mean, this is our service area. We have a lot of local service, but the green areas are where people live. The yellow areas are where the big job centers are. And increasingly, people are moving further south and further east, yet the job centers are in the, in the northwest at Kearney Mesa, UTC, Sorrento Valley. So we want to create these quick connections from the north to the south, from the east to the west. And you're going to find out more about this as uh, I, I speak on. Right. As the saying goes, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And we're going to start by looking at the larger benefits the comprehensive plan will have on all of our regional goals. But as a precursor, we expect that all these numbers you're about to see are going to go up once we analyze the package of projects rather than the projects individually. And the, 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 the Met MTS board gave us that uh, uh, advice uh, last week, right. and that is to take it there. The numbers you'll see today are from Transpo, which uses nationally accepted models to predict the impact and results of each project individually. We expect that the, once the final plan is modeled altogether, we'll see even higher results. First up, ridership. Collectively, we will see close to 200,000 extra weekday trips on transit. As Supervisor Fletcher said, our current ridership is about 300,000 trips a day. So this will be a 64 to 65% increase in weekday riderships. Next, MTS buses and trolleys operate about 30 million miles annually, logging more than 85 million passengers. With Elevate San Diego, this will bump up to more than 50 miles of transit service, a 70% increase over present day. What does that mean? The public transportation system will be much more accessible to those using it. And a majority of this is through embracing the current network, like having buses and trolleys run more frequently and for longer hours. So it's really about making those quicker connections for people, right? And having the buses out there longer that we're going to get into in a little bit. It's all about speed, where you go, and how frequent it comes. That's where people are attracted to transit. And all that adds up to 51,000 fewer metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually. That's the equivalent greenhouse gas produced by 5.7 million gallons of gasoline. And it's not just ridership or environmental benefit that we can expect, but this plan is also estimated to create 120,000 direct and indirect jobs. And that creates a $96 billion positive impact on the economy. So aside from the specific project benefits, the plan as a whole will have a broad benefit for the, great, for, for the greater San Diego economy environment. Hey, Paul, before we go on to the project list next, we want to hear from those of you attending. Tell us which one of those four metrics matters to you when assessing the plan's impact. Is it the ridership increase, the reduction of greenhouse gases, the number of transit miles we'll be adding to the system, or the economic impact that is most important to you? So while we're waiting for those results, Maya, what do you think? What, what do you think are the most important metrics for a transit system and what we're looking at? You think ridership and really getting those numbers up? Yeah, we need to be increasing ridership. In my opinion, that's the top priority um, because if we're increasing ridership, then that means that uh, MTS has succeeded in providing those transportation options like we were just talking about. <clears throat> yeah, and I think it really means that it's a more attractive system. You know, we have that ridership and that's a direct connection to more people riding the system and having that accessibility factor mm -hmm. and, and actually using it. So, so number one we have is uh, ridership. Everybody thinks ridership is the most important. And number two is new transit miles. So that's, that's great too, because that's really about making the system more accessible for people, which we're gonna do uh, significantly through Elevate SD. So that's the big picture of where we're going. And next we'll show you how we're gonna get there. One of the things I think everyone can agree on, regardless of whether you're taking transit or you're in your car, is that we want faster trips. Many of these ideas will make transit competitive with the automobile. And the more options we give people to leave their car at home, the quicker trips will be for those that are still driving. So first, we're going we're, we're to bring a system of brand new transit enhancements along our most congested freeways 
to help speed up travel times from the far reaches of the economy, uh, far reaches of the of the region yep. to where their jobs are. This plan uses the existing infrastructure on a freeway system by building out dedicated transit lanes without taking away general purpose lanes. Here's a quick look at the freeway system where we have transit service operating. And here's how we can better connect the system using high-speed transit under the Elevate plan. This provides new, fast transit options for commuters along the I-805, the I-5, the State Route 52, and the State Route 56. And what we've been hearing is that these are the most congested choke points for people, the most frustrating freeways that people access. And not only that, um, these freeways are actually, um, we can actually do a lot of work on them to really improve them for some transit-only lanes. Absolutely. And I mean, all you have to do, if, if you all travel any one of these highways in the morning to get to work or to get to school, you know exactly what we're talking about. The 52, the 56, the 805, the 5, they're all jammed every day. So the strategy for each of these freeways is going to be a little bit different. For both State Route 52 and 56, which currently have zero transit options, we would add a reversible high-speed transit guideway in the middle of the freeway. UTC and Sereno are two of the largest employment areas in the region, and so we could provide a more direct connection from residential communities in Santee, El Cajon, and Inland North County using the guideways on these two freeways. The 805 may be the most jam-packed freeway in our region. We're proposing widening the left shoulder on the 805 and converting it for a transit lane something that could also be used by uh, emergency vehicles. Lastly, the I-5. <coughs> Our blue line service is the single busiest route in the system, especially during peak commute hours. So let's add direct nonstop service from Iris Avenue to downtown San Diego with a reversible contraflow lane using the zipper barriers like on the Coronado Bridge and on the I-15. So it's really about using the existing infrastructure that's already in place and just getting creative with it and creating some transit-only lanes to really you know, help speed up that travel where people will be stuck in traffic, but they would be seeing this bus zoom by, you know, that'd be going 60 miles an hour on the freeway. Yeah, it, it gets toward, not only is it using our existing infrastructure to improve productivity, uh, but it is now more about how many people can we move, just not vehicles? Right. And that's what's important. We'll also vastly improve our network of rapid routes. These are some of the most popular routes in the MTS system. People like the higher frequency, longer hours of operation. And of course, where we can get dedicated transit lanes, people like speeding past regular traffic too. We currently have seven different rapid routes in the region, which you can see on the screen here. With Elevate San Diego, we want to significantly expand that service, extending the geographic reach of this high-speed limited stop service in the south, east, mid-city, and northern areas of our service territory. In total, Elevate San Diego would bring 18 new rapid routes. They would run a longer span of hours from 4 a.m. to 1 a.m. This would more than triple the number of rapid routes in service to more than two dozen. The priority timing of these projects would depend on which cities and entities give us the best right-of-way access in their region. But even then, we expect that we could have a great number of these routes in service by 2035. Another significant upgrade will be to vastly improve our current system by increasing the frequency and span of service. On the map you see before you, you can see our current network of 96 routes. We have solid coverage but we know that the demand for service is there. Faster, more frequent, and longer hours of operation is really the heart and soul of Elevate. By increasing hours of operation and frequencies, we will see the biggest gains in ridership and the biggest reductions in greenhouse gas reductions. <clears throat> the highlighted route you see now on the screen is where we will see frequency and or span improvements. We will have many bus routes operating twice as often as they do now, the bus runs 15 minutes now. We want to get that down to 12 minutes or 10 minutes. Same with frequencies on the trolley. We're looking to get the green line and orange line down to every seven and a half minutes and to eventually get the blue line down to every five minutes. And this plan includes expanded weekend service as well. The goal here is to make transit easy for people. 
so you can get up and go without needing a schedule. When fre frequencies are better, it means transfers are better, so you spend less time waiting to get to your destination. Another major upside to this project is better matching our local economy, which has been expanded beyond the traditional nine to five working hours. We have a large military audience that needs to be on base early in the morning, late classes on college campuses, restaurant and hotel workers out for late night and overnight shifts. So we'll be a, better be able to meet those demands. The plan will also likely include overnight service for several of our, of our most, uh, in our most popular corridors, including from the border to downtown. One of the best elements of improving frequency and span is that we can start implementing some of that service immediately. We can use our existing fleet to operate earlier in the morning, later in the evening, and add weekend service. And this was something uh, for the past 10 months, we've been doing a lot of community outreach, and that's really what we heard from the community, is like, make it come faster, make it come more frequent, you know, and give us 24-hour service or expand the service hours. So, so we really heard that from the community. That was by and far one of the most popular things that people wanted to do with the system. And it also will have the biggest impact on the system of anything in Elevate that we're doing. So it's, it's a big commitment that we're making. Absolutely. Yep. Next, there are a lot of places on our trolley system where trains are running at the street level. And so we need to look at where we will raise or lower the tracks. Removing the crossovers with street and pedestrian traffic means that our trains can move faster, not having to slow down at grade crossings. Additionally, cars will spend less time idling at intersections because they won't have to wait for crossing gates uh, and, and it increases pedestrian and bike safety as well. This one is really a win-win all around for our trains and passengers, but also for car commuters to not be held up by crossing gates. So we'll fully fund 11 grade separations at different intersections. You can see the list here of the 11 most needed grade crossings in the cities of San Diego, Chula Vista, La Mesa, and Lemon Grove. Hey, Maya, just a question for you about this. You know, I know what do you think about the safety around crossings and that we're looking to do with funding these grade separations and what it means for Vision Zero and some of the other efforts you guys are working on at Circulate? Yeah, thanks for asking that. So um, for those who aren't familiar, Vision Zero is the goal of ending all traffic fatalities and serious injuries on our roads. And um, in order to do that, we need to uh, improve the infrastructure, how our streets are designed. And so in addition to the benefits that Paul was talking about, um, that grade separations can help uh, our trolleys run faster and uh, will make it more convenient to be more frequent. Um, it also means that we can uh, prioritize safe street infrastructure for everyone. So that means that um, pedestrians, people walking, people bicycling, when they're crossing a trolley line, they don't have to um, be crossing the tracks. Mm -hmm. And hopefully with this new um, infrastructure improvement, new capital improvements, uh, that means that uh, those intersections or those corridors can actually see uh, even increased safety improvement with protected bike lanes, maybe wider sidewalks and better intersection designs too. Right, and I think one of the things that we're gonna do is we'll fully fund it, so 100% funding, not 50% funding for these and looking for matches at the state mm -hmm. or federal government or from the cities. We're gonna 100% fund these, and I think that'll really go a long way towards working with the cities and working with other organizations to make sure those types of infrastructure improvements are part of, the, mm -hmm. part of this grade separation program. Another place where we want grade separations is in San Ysidro. There are 11,000 daily riders that use the trolley at San Ysidro. 53% of daily pedestrian border crossers use MTS. And the federal government has invested nearly three quarters of a billion dollars to overhaul those entry points to include pedestrian access to the trolley system. Clearly, there's a lot of use at the center. And there's been a lot of investment in this area that we can capitalize on by improving the transit center there. I mentioned earlier our goal is to increase service to every five minutes on the UC San Diego Blue Line to accommodate the growing demand. To that end, we will, to make, we will need to make major improvements at the San Ysidro Transit Center, including grade separations and a third track to make five minute frequency on the Blue Line a reality. In addition to making the system faster, we also want to create entirely new connections. We've discussed some of that with the new high-speed transit enhancements along freeways, but there are a few more connections to major areas of the region that we need to build out. 
We know a lot of people will be excited about this one because we get asked about it almost everywhere we, <laughs> we go. We do, everywhere we go. Why doesn't the trolley go to the airport? And, and that's funding for a new rail connection to the airport. Not only do we hear that uh, people want this everywhere we go, but in all our major survey efforts, trolley to the airport is at the top of the list. <laughs> Similar to the investments that we've made at our border, there's a lot of activity happening around the airport. Terminals are getting upgraded. There's progress on a potential intermodal center near Old Town. So it's clear that the region must find a better way to connect transit to the airport. One of the ways to do that is a direct connection at both Old Town and 12th and Imperial. This would provide direct access to the airport from all three of our trolley lines, as well as the coaster and Amtrak, and importantly, service the convention center and hotel, right. hotel district of downtown. <clears throat> And as far as timelines for rail projects go, we think we could get this done in a fairly fast manner, with service projected to start within a decade. And this project would not only benefit travelers, there are some 8,000 airport employees that need better access to the site. Hey, Paul, I'm gonna jump in here. I think we're gonna actually go to a survey or a poll that we want people to do. And we want people tuning in to tell us how important a new rail connection or trolley project to the airport is to them. And so I'm, we're getting that feedback in, I'll turn it over to Maya again, and we'd love to hear your thoughts about this project while the audience is weighing in, and just all the discussions that are taking place from the transportation standpoint around the airport site. Right, so I think everyone can agree that this has been a big question mark for a while. So it's great to see um, some planning coming through for how to make this connection possible. Extending the trolley itself makes all the sense in the world, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. you know we already have the infrastructure there. Everyone knows the trolley and how it works. And so just being able to jump on coming from the north and connecting from uh, Old Town or coming from the south or the east, taking the blue line or the green line or any of the number of buses that connect to a trolley station, that just it just makes sense. Right, right. So it'd be a lot of connections there. Okay, so we have the poll results are 80% somewhat or very important think that airport trolley uh, you know, should be a part of the plan. So that's good and that's really consistent with what we've been hearing out there in the community so far. Certainly all the, the other polls we've been done uh, suggest that. So everybody here is kind of falling in line with that as well. As we talked about a bit earlier, providing competitive transit access to economic opportunities is important to us in this process, obviously. We're talking about job centers. You have to talk about Sorrento Valley. We're set to open the Midcoast Trolley next year, which is the single biggest transit investment in San Diego County history. We expect that the line will be a tremendous success in getting people up to UC San Diego and to the UTC area. But then there's another link to be made directly to Sorrento Valley. Sorrento Valley is a tough area to operate traditional transit services due to grade changes from the canyons, businesses tucked away in hills, cul-de-sacs, etc. As you can see in the rendering, one of the projects we're looking at is a Skyway to connect UTC from the Midcoast Trolley Extension. Now, Skyways are popular all around the world. We just really haven't seen them in San Diego, obviously, but you know, a lot of other areas use Skyways as a, as a great form of transportation. Absolutely. Using a Skyway across the 805 and into Sorrento Valley enables us to traverse over traffic in the canyons. Additionally, you know, Skyways can be built faster and for right. far less cost than a rail connection. The project will also include two mobility hubs, which will have a shuttle system to connect people from the Skyway stations to their final destinations. Sorrento needs a lot of improvements. Right now, the only viable option is to drive a car. But we believe that the changes we're proposing with the Skyway, the new dedicated transit lanes on the 56 and the 805 can help frustrated commuters by providing new transportation options. Yeah, so this area is really a priority to better serve with transit and just give people more than just one option to get there. And it's a growing area too. Absolutely. And, and, and there are a lot of areas in our service where territory that are suburban and low density and moving a 40 or 60 foot bus in those areas just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So mobility on demand is another project that can help us creatively serve communities where traditional transit doesn't work. This service could really work well geographically in areas like Poway, Scripps Ranch, Eastlake, and more. 
it's also a service that can be particularly helpful to seniors to gain right. more independence. There are a few options depending on what will work well for varying neighborhoods, and we want to have flexibility as technology improves. But essentially, people will be able to call up an, an on-demand transit provider to pick them up at their door and take them to their final destination. This could be achieved with small shuttle-like MTS vehicles, or partnering with Uber or Lyft or even taxis. Hey Paul, could you see this working in a scenario where um, this mobility on demand could serve the job centers in the morning peak and afternoon peak and then during the day provide that neighborhood service for seniors and others that want to take those neighborhood trips? Is that kind of what we envision? Yeah, I, I, you know, in the, in the early mornings in the rush hours, it's what everybody refers to as first mile, last mile. Right. It's how we make those connections, you know, to the regional transit hubs where we can start to move people regionally. After that, during the midday, is when a lot of people come out to do errands and do shopping, go right. to doctor's appointments and things right. like that. So it can work very well together. So it's, it's the same mode in two different purposes. Correct. Use, yeah. Now the final group of projects we wanna talk about here are ways we can enhance the current rider experience. The biggest improvement under this category we already discussed with the expansion of service hours and frequencies but there's a lot more that we're looking to do for existing riders and for future riders. First up would be the addition of free transit passes for anyone 18 years and under. Free transit for approximately 600,000 students is a big investment, but we think there'll be a significant return on that investment. One, gives kids across the entire region access to school, extracurricular activities, or to part-time jobs and internships. Two, it helps families, particularly low-income families in our service area, to help reduce the financial burdens on them. And three, more and more kids are ditching cars. If we can get them onto transit at a young age, they may become lifelong transit riders with low carbon footprints. And this element of the plan is really one that was a grassroots effort from our community partners that made this come to life. Yeah, and at third, I know we heard a lot from our grassroots community partners on this, but then when we started doing outreach, there was a lot more people out there who thought who could really see the benefit, you know, of having uh, youth passes for free. And I think that was really a, a great, it's great to see that echo. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Next, another improvement that riders could begin to realize to enhance their experience is upgraded and more amenities across the system. This plan would look at both the current services and the expansion of the system and fund $100 million in upgrades. And, and those could include more restroom access, Wi-Fi at stations on vehicles, better shelters, shade, lighting, a more real-time information for, for customers. Hey, Paul, this is a good opportunity for us to check back in with the audience one final time. So we have another poll for you, and we'd like you to tell us of the listed amenity upgrades, which one is most important to you? So as of now, the way it stands now, we have a pool of funding that is slated to go towards amenities, but the specific amenities have yet to be decided. So it'd be helpful to hear from you to see what you think are the most important amenities uh, that we can provide through Elevate SD. <coughs> so, you know, we've heard a lot about amenities, you know, particularly lately. And I think all of these different things are great. And I think, Paul, you touched on this where it's not just you know a growing a a new system or or an enhanced system. It's also our current system and making sure that the amenities and other things keep up with that. So it's just a modernized system all throughout. It's about improving the whole experience of using transit. Yeah. And if people are going to spend time on transit, you know one of the biggest benefits will be to pro be productive during that time. You get in a car now, you got to focus on on the road right. in order to get there right. safely. That's sometimes an hour or so that's gone from your day, morning and afternoon. This makes this can make things a lot more productive. Yeah, I think so, to a more attractive system. So, so we have our poll results in. So the number one item, number one amenity was real-time info, so really improving the technology around transit. And then number two is more shelter. So people want to be sheltered from that rain, or in San Diego, we have to deal with the sun. So uh, that's certainly uh, good to hear. Another topic that we're hearing more about from the community is safety and wanting to feel safe on board our buses and trolleys. Safety, of course, is always top of mind for us as well. If we grow the system, the security measures need to grow with it. Additionally, it was one of the top priorities in the public surveying we did late last year. We're proposing to increase security funding by 50% 
over existing levels. This funding can be put forward towards infrastructure and technology, like more cameras and better lighting, but also toward more personnel, more security team members or partnerships with local law enforcement, or expanding an ambassador program at stations and on vehicles. The bottom line is that we want to make sure that people continue to feel safe riding MTS. Lastly, getting people on transit also, makes, also means making it easier for people to get to transit. As communities become more and more multimodal, and as we see more housing and density being built out, yep. we want to help cities within our service area make improvements to their local streets and sidewalks. So the program of projects also includes a grant program for each of our member cities and the county to fund access to transit programs in their communities. We'll provide up to $3 million annually to help cities fund costs like sidewalk construction, road repairs, new bike lanes, safe routes to school programs, and more. So, you know, th this program was actually initially at a $2 million level. We bumped that up to $3 million because certainly we heard from Circulate and others in the community in our cities, you know, about the importance to, you know, providing, you know, these transit grants to support that access to transit. And so I'm hoping, Maya, that you can speak to this as well. You know, I know you've been a big proponent of the complete streets and access to transit in some of our community advisory committee meetings. And so that's, that's great to get that feedback. Can you speak to a little why this, this type of project matters and how access to transit benefits communities? You know, I think what's important to realize with this is that th this, is, this is a funding source that would go directly to our local cities and jurisdictions. Um, and so it's great because a grant program like this benefits everyone within the MTS jurisdiction. It benefits um, all the cities potentially if they apply and it can benefit people traveling by all modes. What's important is that people are able to access transit by walking or biking right. safely. And so this type of funding source could be used by the cities to improve infrastructure along their corridors. And guess what? It could also fix, um, it could also be used for pothole repair. And so it really does benefit everyone. And I think that uh, even more could be going towards this grant program. Right, right. Lastly, I want everybody to know that we are and will continue to coordinate everything with Sandag, especially for the future Blue Line and Purple Line projects. If you're not familiar with Sandag, they are the transportation planner for the entire county of San Diego, and they are responsible for what's called the Regional Transportation Plan, which looks 50 years into the future of where we will be and provides a roadmap of how we get there. Sandag is working on some high investment high benefit infrastructure concepts along the 805, the I-5. And we want to support Sandeg in that effort because this quarter from South Bay to Sorrento is our biggest challenge. We work hand in hand with Sandeg on their efforts as, as they look at long range planning and they, and they support what we're doing through Elevate to make more immediate changes in our transit system. So we're proposing a $35 million in jumpstart funding for Sandeg to get plans off the ground from some north-south corridor projects. Yeah, and I think everybody realizes that's the real challenge is that north-south corridor. Certainly we have some challenges from east to west, but that north-south corridor along the 5 freeway, 805 freeway is really a priority for all transportation planners in San Diego. All you have to do is look at the blue line, the, eight, the I-5 and the I-805 to understand that. 50% of everybody on the I-5 out of South Bay every morning is heading all the way to Sorrento. That's a lot of people. Can you imagine coupling that with 805, 52, 56, all converging on that Sorrento area? Absolutely. That's a lot of people. In closing, you know, we know that the question of when we're gonna do this is, is, is as important as what we're doing. And one of the biggest benefits of all the project we're proposing is how quickly we estimate we can make significant improvements. We want these changes to be relatively immediate. We plan to have all the Elevate projects fully implemented or at least substantially off the ground in the first 18 years. We have immediate transportation challenges we're facing with population growth, job growth, traffic congestion, and more. And we need immediate solutions to address them. We think we can deliver many of these solutions through this Elevate San Diego plan. Okay, thanks Paul for that briefing. We hope you all got a better grasp of what we're looking at in the immediate future to make transit more competitive across the region. 
And if you haven't already, go ahead and submit a question and we'll jump into the Q&A portion of the webinar. We'll do our best to get as many of your questions as we can with the time we have left. And if you don't get your question answered here, we will have access to all of your questions uh, following the webinar and we'll get back to those questions directly. So it looks like we're, uh, we're back to our camera. Thank you for coming back to us in, in the MTS boardroom. Um, we also have uh, MTS planning director, uh, Dennis Desmond, who's joined us. He's really put a lot of work into this plan over the last year and even longer than that. And um, so we'll go ahead and open it up to some of the questions that we have. But okay, so the first one is um, expanded service hours and 24 hour service was one of the most popular projects on the Vision Builder. Will you run 24 hour service everywhere or on specific routes? Will trolleys be running later at night? Maybe Dennis, you can start us off since you're the newbie here. Sure. So we've, we've really looked at two things for this overnight service. And the first thing is that we need to create a network. So a single route here and a single route there that connect to each other don't make a lot of sense. So we want a network that really covers the entire region. Then we looked at the corridors where we really have the most ridership and the most potential for overnight ridership. So we've selected a group of about 10 different routes that are really, really our best ridership routes that all connect, converge in different areas, uh, different um, high capacity transfer points. And those are the routes that we're really gonna focus on initially for the overnight service. So we're right. talking about routes like 929 along Third Avenue and Highland and South Bay, uh, our I-5 express route that we're proposing, uh, our route 12 that goes down into Skyline Hills, uh, our route eight that goes out to the beach areas, all these right. routes to help people that are really working the overnight shifts, um, that uh, hotels and to restaurants that need to get home. Um, and again, yeah. it's getting back to connecting where people are living, where they're working. Right. And one of the big ones is along the I-5 corridor in the blue line. I mean, yeah. for anybody who's been down at San Ysidro for that first trolley trip in the morning, you can see how many people are waiting there. And so we're proposing overnight service, express bus service from San Ysidro all the way up. Yep. Overnight. And, you know, we just decreased service on the blue line, too, because the demand is so high and the demand keeps on growing and growing. So now we're down to seven and a half minutes pretty much all day on the blue line. So so that's even an increase now. And we'd like to do even more. We think the market's there. OK, here's another question. So I know MTS has an electric bus pilot program. So we just started implementing electric buses all throughout our service territory. We're trying them out and seeing how they're doing. Um, will we see more electric buses with this plan? Maybe, Paul, you can address that. You've been working on this issue quite a bit. Yeah, uh, you you will. I mean, we are, uh, there is a, a mandate now uh, through the California Resources Board that transit converts uh, to zero emission buses. Uh, that could be the battery electric buses that we're testing now, or it could be things like hydrogen buses. Right. Uh, that doesn't kick in for a couple more years. Uh, so that's why we're testing now understanding its limitations, understanding how we're gonna build the infrastructure to charge vehicles, understanding the operating characteristics. Um, so you will see more as we go on. Yeah, and I think we've embedded those costs into the financial model too, that we would be buying electric buses when we do these increases in service. So certainly we're accounting for that, we're planning on it. And it seems like, you know, as it stands today, unless rules change and everything else, you know, they are going to be about part of Elevate SD. And it's important to know that we haven't included any costs in here for changing over the existing fleet, only the new fleet. I don't want anybody to think that we're, we're asking for, uh, you know, increased funding uh, simply to comply with a state mandate. Uh, we acknowledge that we have that responsibility to do and we'll handle that. But with all new service, it likely will be zero emissions. Okay, so we have time for a couple more questions. Um, here's another one. Why not include college students in the free passes? So maybe expanding it from 18 to 24. Yeah, so, I, I'll take that again. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of cost. Right. Um, it, it, you know, we're trying to help families and, and youth, uh, you know, through high school when the vast majority of them are still living at home and when they have an impact on family expenses, et cetera. Um, I, I, you know, it, it would be great uh, to to offer this up to 24 years old. It's just that, you know, our target audience for transit is like from 18 until the early 30s. So going free all the way up to 24 is a big chunk of our riders and has a huge revenue impact on us. So it really is a matter of, you know, do we spend the money that ultimately this would generate 
on giving free transit or do we try to create a better system for everybody in the region to access where they need to go to, to find jobs or to get the school, to get the training, to get the better job. And we just made the determination that that's, that's, that's the best possible way that we could do to have a positive impact on people in this community. Right, so we wouldn't be able to do all the things that we just talked about you know, and build out the network the way we really think it could have a major impact on improving connectivity. If we bumped up that age, it would it'd certainly be a, a big revenue yeah, challenge. Eight, for us. 18 yeah. to 24 year old uh, are a huge generator of, uh, of our, our fare basis in, yeah. in our system. Yeah, and with college students too, we do have discounted passes through the universities and through the community colleges. So there are some discounts out there that, you know, student that are available to students. Yeah, and UC San Diego has a, has a transit pass that every student that goes there uh, gets a free pass. We're, we're working with San Diego State University to try to do the same thing, but semester passes are, are also a great deal, and, and students that access those uh, can ride transit much more economically than the $72 monthly pass. Right. Okay, so here's, a, here's another question. Um, how do you determine how long a commute time should be versus the same route in a car? So maybe Dennis, do you want to chime in on that? We've done some modeling a little bit on different routes sure. and how they'd be improved. Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, what we've done is we've taken some sample trips, some of the longer and more uh, challenging trips uh, taken by transit now, and some of these that we see take two or two and a half hours now on transit, we think we can get those down to the 60 to 90 minute range. Right. Um, and even 60 to 90 minutes for a lot of these really long trips is really competitive with the automobile and heavy traffic. Um, we're seeing just a congestion. Um, trips that take 20 or 30 minutes with no traffic at all can take 60 to 90 minutes in heavy right. traffic. And we can be competitive with that, especially with some of our initiatives like the Express. So those we can bypass 15, 20, 25 minutes of traffic. Right. Uh, by using some of the exclusive transit guideway, and that's what's going to give us a competitive edge. That's going to really improve that speed of travel for us. Right. So, so okay, I think I, I think um, you know that's that's the the final question. Again, we appreciate you joining us. Um, as a final reminder, we'll be sending out the post webinar survey after all the sessions close. So to give you to get some more specific feedback after you've had a chance to digest all this information, feel free to come back at us with some more questions. Keep an eye out for that later in the month. If you know people who'd like to learn more but are unable to attend today, our next sessions are February 19th at 7 a.m., February 20th at 9.30, and a Spanish language session on February 25th at 5.30 p.m. And also, a recording of the webinars will also be made available and will be sent out with the survey later this month as well. So again, we encourage you to learn more about these projects. Check out our website, which is elevatesd2020.com. Thanks for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your day.